So Jared, also known as Cyber Dandy, is with me today on the Diet Soap podcast. Uh, we're also going to be releasing this uh, on his uh, podcast. What What's the name of your podcast again, Jared? Uh, right now, I'm just calling it the shows that I do or the episodes that I do. So it's on the that's Cyber Dandy. That's, that's, yeah. catch, that's catchy. Yeah. So it'll be on the episodes or the shows that Cyber Dandy does. And um, people can watch it there as well. You can Google that shows that I do or episodes that I do. Um, so, yeah, we're, you reach out to me through Facebook, which is the way you have to reach people over 40 or over 50 in my case. Uh, I guess no one else is really on Facebook these days. But you wanted to talk to me about the situation is international and specifically about the British contingent uh, of the SI. Um, right. And, and uh, while I'm familiar with the uh, British contingent, I know about um, Chris Gray and I even have read his book, Leaving the 20th Century Behind, I think is the title of his book. Yep. Um, and I've interviewed TJ Clark in the way back in the past and around 2012, I think, um, was when I interviewed him. Um, I, I am not as well versed in the narrative around the British contingent in the SI, like how the Brits came to join the SI, uh, why they were expelled, how many, uh, British people were in the SI or the British con- wing of the SI, what the difference between the British SI and King Mob actually is. Um, These are things that are kind of in my mind somewhere, and I might be able to dig them up, but you'll have to remind me. So, like, let's start with that last question. What is King Mob, and what is the British SI? So, King Mob uh, formed after the English section was expelled from the Situationist International. And Mm. same people, same principles, but they formed King Mob and started doing their antics and writing out of that. They produced a magazine called King Mob Echo, Mm -hmm. which uh, you could find online actually. And it it has all the standard SI uh, tropes and analysis and critique. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, uh, from what I understand, there's actually two parts to the English or British involvement with the situation with the SI, um, Mm -hmm. there was an English member at the formation. However, uh, they were personally expelled. And then what, um, there was a more official association between the English SI and the Paris SI. And basically what happened is the Boer did not like, um, the association that the the English SI had with uh, Ben Maria from Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers mm-hmm. and, um, and also Abby Hoffman. And mm-hmm. he thought that, you know, Abby Hoffman was a mystical idiot, I believe was his quote, mm-hmm. and said he didn't want to work with anyone that would have anything to do with them. Hmm. Um, and what was his objection to the, uh, to the, Ben Maria, is that who it was? Yeah, yeah. So Ben Maria is an American anarchist who uh, did a magazine called Black Mask. And mm-hmm. this was in the early 60s, like before 1968. And also was in a group called Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers. Or mm-hmm. in, for short, they called themselves the Motherfuckers. Mm-hmm. And... The big disagree. I basically, De Boer said that they disagreed on practically everything when it came to revolutionary strategy. Okay, so yeah, I mean, the um, why was it that the British contingent of the SI would be friendly with anarchists, and the the French SI were not? Uh, it's an interesting question. I think it just that's who wound up taking on the situationist critique in, in the British context. Um, so Andre Breton eventually became a anarchist, a surrealist. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in, in France, there were 
there definitely was tension between the anarchists and the and the SI. However, once it crossed over to Britain, like ten years later, a lot of what they were reading was raw Vanagem or Van Vanagem, however it's pronounced. Yeah, and um, Charles Radcliffe was one of the main members of the English SI, and he was an anarchist. So mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't just that they're friendly. The about half the British SI were anarchists. Okay, and was any contingent of the French SI anarchist, or were they all kind of anti-Bolshevik Marxists? They were, yeah, they were pretty much. I mean, they council communists or libertarian Marxists, whatever you want to call it. Uh, mm -hmm. So no, I don't think they were. Um, the reason, one of the main reasons I'm fascinated by the SI is because for me, they're really the practical application of Jean-Paul Sartre. And uh, if you dig deep enough, you find out that the Lettrist International and the board and the whole thing uh, is heavily influenced by uh, not only Sartre, but Lefebvre and mm -hmm. some other people. But the term situation, what they're talking about is a Sartrean concept. Hmm. And... Um, uh, I, I recall De Boer being fairly critical of Sartre. Yeah, um, he, and and uh, I don't like. I think did didn't Sartre uh, hang out at the Cafe Flores quite a they, lot? Yeah, that, so Sartre hung out at a diff, like what? What would it be? An upper scale cafe yeah, compared to where the SI were hanging out? Yeah, I've been to both cafes. Like in um, in two thousand eight. I landed a contract to write my first novel and decided to set it in Paris in 1968 and put and have Guy Debord be uh, one of the characters and <laughs> um, and uh, make it about the some Nanterre University students um, and also about Christopher Robin Milne and his involvement fictional in in the uh, uh, Paris you know, uh, riots of 68. Um, oh, right. so it was kind of an odd novel, but, uh, I, I went to, to Paris and went to both of those cafes and yeah, there's a marked difference between where they would have, where the, uh, SI would hang out and where Sartre would hang out. And, and what, what I recall of De Boer is that, um, uh, in his critique of Sartre would just be that Sartre had been incorporated into the spectacle that he would, right. he'd, you know, he had been uh, turned into a celebrity rather than an actual revolutionary. He was a public intellectual, but not a revolutionary anymore. Yeah, and that's, that's true. Not. And that's the same thing I I found came across that in my research as well, as far as what De Boer says about Sartre. However, mm -hmm. uh, Claire Gilman and Peter Wollen, who wrote the book you mentioned at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what, uh, the Leaving the 20th Empire. Century? Or oh, leaving the twentieth century behind, or or uh, the one he uh, wrote was called "A Brief Moment in Time." Uh -huh. yeah. Something, some, yeah. Uh, they they basically validate that Sartre Sartre's notion of situation is what they're building off of. It's not the only thing, obviously, that influenced them, but the concept of situation was really a big part of Sartrean philosophy because he said that freedom only exists in a situation. Mm -hmm. So there's, so for me, there's that interesting uh, genealogy of how you get from this notion of situation and Sartre and all the way to, you know, what, I mean, today when I see something like Burning Man or temporary autonomous zones, I think of the SI. And mm -hmm. to me, it's a, pretty much a continual genealogy. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, well, what, what do, what did Sartre mean of when he would refer to a situation and how was that different than just being placed into history? Like uh, understanding your, that you're, you are defined by and uh, responding to your historical circumstance. 
So basically, it comes down to alienation. And for Sartre, the non-alienated uh, relationship with the with history is a situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's the unmediated or non-alienated form. Mm-hmm. And this is why it was so important to the SI, because what they were trying to do was create these situations that were you know, outside of the spectacle or in the British case, and this is actually where the differences start to come out, the British were hyper-spectacular. Yeah, now, that, so they were kind of like accelerationists of the, yep. of the spectacle? Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah, so rather than try to resist your the unreality of life, embrace it and intensify it? Mm-hmm, yep, and that's where you get King Mob, and you get people like Malcolm McLaren, who you and I both know had so much to do with punk rock and the Sex Pistols. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's um, it's interesting. I've been. Re- did, have you seen the series of videos that I've been making about the Situationist? The uh, ones about the boar, yeah. yeah, yeah, about the Society of Spectacle, particularly, and rereading that book and and summarizing it, and. Um, Reading it again now, I mean, when I first read it in the 90s, I read it probably from the perspective of somebody who was immersed in, you know, 90s counterculture uh, without even really intending to be. Um, and as a kind of romantic thinker myself and as a would-be novelist and, and short story writer and uh, artist. And when I read him today... I just read him as a Marxist, just like Mm -hmm. as part of the tradition of Marxism. And and more than that, as like coming out of the struggle for socialism that had stretches back to, you know, uh, let's say 1848, but certainly to 1917 and um, 1918. And um, so I see De Boer wrestling with the same questions that had been wrestled with at the end of the 19th century. Um, roughly, and and the the solution is different, but you know, the, also you can place him within the historical moment of 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 uh, the fifties, first and foremost, like after the Hungarian Revolution, the the, the uh, Western left, and as right. a response to the Soviet Union, um, and uh, I've been come like I have a bunch of Lefebvre's books, uh, the Revolution of not Revolution, I'm sorry, the Critique of Everyday Life on my bookshelf right over here. and uh, But I also am interested in, um, even more so, Cornelius Castriotis. Yeah. Um, uh, socialism or Barbarism. Yeah, which is a publication that De Boer worked on and came up through. Um, but what was, what was strange for me coming back to De Boer was I, when I started – Reading DeBoer in the 90s, I was an anarchist at best, you know, like a Chomsky style, right? Uh, Z magazine reading and anarchy magazine reading anarchist in the Pacific Northwest, like a basically a rad lib. And um, mm-hmm. when then over time after economic crisis, particularly, I got involved with actual Marxism, the, a group called the MHI which had originally been formed by uh, Raya uh, Doyanskaya, who mm-hmm. was a, um, a, a trot, a part of Trotsky's uh, inner circle. Um, and she broke with Trotsky, and then um, with Trotskyism, uh, you know, in the, in the 50s and 60s, I believe. And she started the Marxist Humanists, uh, or actually it was called News and Letters. That was her independent group. But before that, she was part of the uh, either Forrest Johnson or Johnson Forrest, Tennessee. I always get that confused. But Cornelius Castriotis and Roya Doyaskaya worked together on a journal and, a, and in a group called Facing Reality um, in the 50s and 60s. So the, the, the anti-Bolshevik turn after mm-hmm. the Hungarian Revolution is, to me, what defines the situation as international later in the 60s it's like a it's a continuation of that uh and um and so you can start to situ you can start to situate the situationists in this 
long struggle for socialism. Um, yeah. Uh, and I think that's a more interesting way to approach the SI than the way I did, which was as a pro situ, you know, uh, what, I don't know, he, uh, he then, or, or, or what would, what would heretic, you know, a pro situ heretic, you know, turning it into punk rock, having to go through right. punk rock before I could even begin to understand the SI. So anyway. Yeah. Maybe. And that's similar with me because, you know, crime think was basically my, my, so what's mm -hmm. funny about your, what you say about the nineties is you sort all the stuff that I got into was, it seems like that's the stuff that you, that missed you when you were into anarchism in the nineties. So I got into the post left, all yeah. the stuff that was inspired by the SI basically. Right. So that would be like, that came out of anarchy. I mean, anarchy magazine. Yes. Was post left back then in the late yeah. 90s or mid to late nineties. Yeah. And, um, the, and crime think, sure. I read crime think, uh, in the late nineties around the time of the, the WTO protests and yes. things like that. And, uh, I was on indie media, Mm -hmm. You know, do you remember indie media? Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I was part of that milieu, at least as a consumer of it. I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't really, I did write for indie, med indie media and I participated in protests against the, the invasion of, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as somebody who was coming at it at the, at even my activism within the peace movement from, a kind of anarchist situationist perspective that I don't think made a lot of sense, but you know, I was doing my best and um, yeah. So I definitely picked it all up uh, in my twenties and, and tried to deepen my understanding of it. Um, and then I felt as though I had completely broken with it all in 2008 when the economic crisis hit and I just like, no, I'm forget all that. I'm going to read Marx. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm going to I'm going to go back and understand capital and I'm going to try to understand the history of Marxism and the history of the struggle for socialism as it, you know, as it developed into the really existing socialism of the 20th century and all of that. I'm just going to see what it is. And then I had to come to realize that, no, everything I picked up in the 90s had been from Marxism itself and the struggle for socialism just in this sort of. Uh, well, in the spectacularized way. So, yeah. So you said something earlier about um, coming to the realization that the SI and De Boer were really Marxism for the most part. And when you started reading it that way, it made sense. Mm -hmm. What, where in earlier Marxist theory do you find the idea of recuperation and uh, the spectacle? Okay, well, the spectacle. I would say that the idea of the spectacle um, is uh, about the the way in which the commodity fetish operates, um, and you can find that in capital, like that the that the way in which real social relations go on behind workers' backs through mm -hmm. the exchange of commodities and through the market um, is the foundational ideas that are, that De Boer is tr attempting to develop with his concept of the spectacle. So, but you have to start by understanding the Marxist con categories of commodity and, and, fet and the fetish nature of the commodity before you can understand the depth of the, of uh, De Boer's notion of the spectacle. To get to understand why it isn't just the media brainwashing people, right? Uh, but is a set of social relations. You have to understand that those social relations are fundamentally uh, in the realm of production, or at least the Marxism that he is grappling with would place them there. The place of you know. Now there's there are debates within Marxism. There was a crisis within Marxism. There are different strands of Marxist interpretation uh, of the central notions, and they arise because of different uh, struggles to achieve socialism. So 
Uh, I'm not saying that De Boer is simply the exactly the same as Karl Marx. I'm just saying <laughs> he developed out of a struggle for socialism. So on that note, one of the things that is different between the the French and the British SI mm-hmm. is that well, not SI, but the situationist, was that the British focused, instead of on recuperation, they would focus on hegemony. And I, uh, from what I was reading, this is why they took the approach they did as far as being more accelerationist, is because they saw it uh, less about a uh, the problem of being recuperated as more a problem of achieving hegemony right uh Mm -hmm. so uh so they were focused on how can we fight the hegemony uh and then uh what they wound up getting at was embracing the youth movements uh the counterculture Mm -hmm. and uh that's something that the french did not do they would analyze uh the rioters and events like that, like uh, the Watts riots and things like that, but they mm-hmm. wouldn't really reach out and try to embrace the counterculture that was happening. And that's mm-hmm. what the, the English did. And that's, and I really think that's what brings it closer to our context in America, because when socialists in America try to do a situationist style of group, you know, a very militant, uh, exclusive, um, in dialogue with the public sort of thing, it doesn't really go over. Americans don't have the avant-garde history and uh, mm, that sort right. of mm-hmm. uh, respect or relationship with ideas, I guess. So uh, the influence, I think, uh, is seen more as it comes through British and is anglicized. Uh, and then interacts with the American punk scene, really, the American counterculture. Right. I mean, there was an American avant-garde, um, you know, and they're in the fine arts, you know, and it developed into things like cubism and and then yeah. expressionism and so forth. I mean, it was, um, well, it, uh, really expressionism um, and abstract expressionism. Um, but it was... You know, being American, it, it was also incorporated into the American s- state uh, and and the, the that apparatus, and not not that it was without any value, even as an avant garde. But just um, if you're looking back from, uh, like, let's say, 1970 or 1980 or 1990, uh, and looking for the kinds of ascetic experiences that seem to be reflected in the texts of 1967's uh, Society of Spectacle, you're, you're going to look to like science fiction novels and comic books and, uh, and, and psychedelic art um, and psychedelic um, bands maybe uh, and the whole culture, because that seems to be what is uh, attempting to, break from the hegemonic expression of the culture of capitalism in America, the, which was really developed in the fifties, right? It was not that old of a concept it's, you know, the, the uh, suburban life and the, Oh, right. Yeah. Right. You know, like post-World War II, post-World War II American hegemonic culture. Yeah. Um, And which is what, yeah, which is what you would be rebelling against in 1980 or 1989 or, you know, as a leftist. Um, but, to, but what, but that notion that, that the cultural hegemony is the primary difficulty that doesn't that come from Gramsci? And uh, Gramsci? Yes. And from my, what I read, a lot of uh, the British were, were interacting with Gramsci as well. So right. they were, they were, Borrowing from multiple sources. Yeah, and and so you have to to really understand 
why the notion of hegemony, as Gramsci explained it, was attractive and, you know, had some, uh, became itself sort of hegemonic in the British left, say. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, you have to ask, you know, what, what was Gramsci wrestling with? What problems was he trying to overcome? Uh, which would have been the failure of the European re- revolutions in the early 20th century and then the rising up of fascism. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, so you're, again, what I would like to point out is like, there are all these different figures and they're all struggling with the same real situations, the real yes. history uh, of, of, of the struggle for socialism, which happened. And it, they're not just um, YouTubers, you know, like pontificating about some idea. They're not science fiction writers dreaming up things. They are revolutionaries who were struggling with actual political conflicts right. uh, in their lives that they were a part of through the uh, party, um, whether it was a Trotskyist party or a communist party or uh, anti-Bolshevik, you know, Trot splinter group or what have you it, they were all of them were struggling with um what was a revolution a long go, ongoing revolution um so yeah so what um what do you what do you think all of this has to bear on today's context because we've watched a lot of the re, uh what I think a lot of the inspired people by the SI kind of fail. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, temporary autonomous zones and underground movements and people trying to do DIY, uh, whatever, whether it's the hippie commune movement or any of these things. And it seems like all of this is in the past now. And, um, but it's, but the spectacle really is still here. I mean, these things are still a problem for socialism and anarchism or anything on against. Right. That. Um, well, there's, you know, you, you asked that question in a way that makes me feel a little bit stumped, but I can answer the first part of it, like what is the relevance of the situationist international? Sure, event? yeah. More easily than I can answer the implied question in the second part, which is like, well, the spectacle's still here. What are we going to do about it? You know, like I'm not sure. But the um, first part is like, why is it relevant? Well, it's helpful to understand the history behind not just the situationist, but if you peel that back and see how it connects to the broader history of the socialist struggle is helpful because then you can be a bit more critical uh, of your moment. Like when the temporary autonomous zones were being put together in the wake of George Floyd, of the George Floyd protest, for instance, Um, you could at least in theory, you know, if you, if you had dared to um, been critical of the reaction to the George Floyd murder and uh, the way in which the rioting and unrest was transformed kind of, I, I think, unconsciously or without much reflection into a repetition mm-hmm. of, of the, what had come before. Um, I mean, I saw this uh, in my own kids. It was kind of, and, you know, uh, my uh, critiques, that I, which were lovingly given, like they, I wasn't damning them or anything. I want, I wanted their their project to succeed, but, but nonetheless, they they, they could agree, but they couldn't take it up because there was no easy way to take it up, and just by one or two people understanding. But I heard that the groups of people organizing to protest against the police and to call for the abolition of the police in Eugene, Oregon. We're reading the anarchist cookbook and crime think oh. and, <laughs> and, um, and they were having like emergency meetings to hand out Xerox copies of these, this material, because it was the only material that they was ready to hand for them to use mm-hmm. to try to 
conceptualize how to be revolutionary. Um, it w- they wanted to they wanted to organize a struggle against what they at that moment felt it was an unlivable, unacceptable society, and they turned to what they could easily find, um, which was uh, anarchism, a certain kind of you know eclectic anarchism and in, in, in terms of organization and then uh you know uh mix that with a certain kind of racial politics which put which ended up in practical terms just putting way too much pressure um and demands on a small group of people in a mostly white city right like so you had like maybe 10 people of color who were involved at all and they had to do all the work because they were the only ones who could be the top organizers because of it was called the BIPOC group, you know, instead of just right. being a, a socialist group. Um, so you could start to see the ways in which the repetition without thought was setting up, is setting up a failure and the, and the necessity for, understanding the history of the socialist struggle so that you can understand where the notions like notions of hegemony came from, what they were trying to solve, maybe what their limitations were even at the time, um, rather than picking up these concepts as if they're secret keys to a revolution that would have happened already if only people have had the courage or had been young enough and Which you know, fast would be enough. A very, is a very idealist yeah. reading, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the Eugene events. I did visit the Chaz or Chop in Seattle. Yeah, yeah, and right. And my kid went there for a couple of days too, at my request with the camera so I could put it on the YouTube channel I was running at the time. Anyway, yeah, I mean, it, it is hard, it's hard for me to think of how you can do anything even like that and not have it recuperated pretty quickly. Uh, and I so you know I sort of read that as a continuation of Occupy uh, strategy anyway, just right? In response to a different circumstance, mm-hmm. um, right? And the Occupy movement itself was very consciously a repetition of of the Situationists. Um, it was put. It was organized by the uh, by people at Adbusters magazine, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if, yeah, mm-hmm. your viewers will know that, but uh, Ad Busters is a detournment uh, mm-hmm. art magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing. You know, the I last get- thing I read in Ad Busters magazine, uh-huh. the, like I went to a, a vintage store and I found a copy of Ad Busters. Mm-hmm. I picked it up and I opened it up, and there was a, a, a lecture by Heidegger. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. About technology. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So you know, you can start to see how things go wrong for certain romanticized versions of the SI that's forgotten the Marxist uh, origins of the of the project. Yeah, and for I mean, you know, you say Marxist, I say Proudhon, but okay, a lot okay. of the time we're talking about <laughs> the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, even with the council council idea you find that in Proudhon and Marx Mm -hmm. it's um I mean they basically were saying a lot of the same stuff but there were some differences you know there was a reason why the anarchists and the Marxists split but trying to settle uh that moment from today is probably beyond either one of us right (laughs) yeah and I think that if we were to compare people socialists today to the first international, uh, I think there's more differences now from uh, people today and them than any of them had with each other. It's just so, I mean, the focus uh, the focus is so different on what people do now and people were doing then with labor, or with uh, really functional mutual aid projects and things like that. Mm-hmm. So what would you have wanted to have happen in the wake of George Floyd's murder? Like, how do you think that energy could have been put to some political use? 
Uh, I am. Um, some of the messaging could have been better for sure, but to me, messaging is a very small part of a bigger puzzle. And I think that uh, I'm. I think institution building, or at least some sort of alternatives that are organized, is really the solution to most. Uh, most struggles. And by that, I mean like material solutions. So, uh, building more formal neighborhood networks that, you know, could supplant police. I don't, I, I do think fundamentally the problem is police, uh, overreaction and the way they're trained and the way they're funded and militarized. I, I think that Mm -hmm. critique is very valid and Mm -hmm. that, the funding they get if you go on a city level and you look at their budgets and see how they compare with other things, they, they get way too much funding um, because they're buying military equipment. But um, yeah, and that started because of the, my, my, what I I think is true. I mean, like maybe it didn't start at this moment, but it was certainly intensified after uh, September 11th. Yeah, and the war on drugs too. Right, the yeah. war on drugs before that, but but right, but but, but after September 11th, the intensification of uh, and the militarization of the police um, was consciously done in an effort to supposedly combat terrorism. Yeah, but, and and really all of society was militarized uh, to an extent. I mean, a lot of the fashion trends among my age group, like millennials, older millennials, the beards and neck tattoos and a lot of that comes out of what's called global war on terror culture which Mm. is based on uh like special ops stereotypes like the people you would imagine being special operations with the big beards and tattooed Mm. up and uh uh, that kind of gun culture that sort of thing is directly comes out of post 9-11 Okay, yeah, but um, I would say that I'm more afraid of people who look neat and tidy, or you know, and or <laughs> or you know, who who look oh. um, fashionable <laughs> and like they could uh, d- do well in a in a upscale nightclub in New York than I am of uh, somebody who has a big bushy beard and neck tattoos. Because um, even though they have this militaristic culture behind them, it's like. And they're also probably more likely to be like having to go work for a wage to make a living. Oh, yeah. Oh, do you mean as far as their capacity to recuperate the left? Uh, and what? Oh, and what yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. In terms of their, in terms of their, you. yeah, I'm not sure where they're going to shoot me. No, but I'm, I'm comfortable enough. I don't get worried about being shot very often, right? I That's do good. worry. Uh, um, but no, like their capacity to absorb and misdirect the left, you know, rather than be um, an active participant, partic- participant in a, an actual uh, independent left. Like I would trust some guy who has the wrong tattoos, not, I mean, to a limit, um, you know, oh, like yeah. that has some, some like, you know, has war on terror tattoos, not Nazi swastikas, but war on terror tattoos, you know, some sort of militarist, like a, mermaid or like the starbucks mermaid or whatever on his neck i would trust that person over somebody who's coming out of the an ivy league school and has and is very concerned about telling me what her, uh, their pronouns are and, and it goes to right. their banking job or whatever we used to call those people non-profiteers <laughs> right 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 yeah yeah well that's the other thing it's in uh the, you know in uh 2020 after the murder of george floyd um there was on the streets a very apparent attempt to recuperate the movement yeah um, that there was that but i also think that the way in which it was apparent was also um misleading to the people who were there because on the one hand yeah you had these obvious democratic party hacks Wandering around through the protests, trying and and in many t- in many instances out organizing the rats. Yes, right. Well, they're so out they, funded. 
you know, they were, you know, they were well-funded. They had these placards printed by, you know, mass produced placards. They, they had bullhorns with, and the batteries worked, you know, um, <laughs> And and they you know and they were all the right color for the most part too. They you know they didn't uh, they had it they had everything down, and they would go out and they would you know shout for defunding the police rather than abolishing the police. Which right. Was the, way the radicals and the uh, Democrats were s- split. However, um, the radicals shared a lot of assumptions with the Democrats when yes. they were out on the streets and that they didn't get to question. One of the assumptions that they shared was that something immediate could happen. That something um, that but by, by making your voice heard and causing a disruption alone, something could happen. And the Democrats thought that, and they were right, for themselves, for their own project, right? Because if you wanted to undercut and 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 outcompete the Republicans, making your voice heard, causing a big disruption, um, and and creating a certain kind of impression in the media, all of that could help you get more votes for Biden later on, right? Mm-hmm. And um, but if you wanted to radicalize the working class and organize the working class for a revolutionary struggle that wasn't going to happen through a media spin and an impression. It had to be like, it would have to have been done on another level, on a political level, on a long-term level. Um, and, and none of the kids that I knew who were involved in that, in that had, it wasn't like they didn't want to do it or they, or it just, it didn't, con- they, it wasn't really conceivable to them on their own. And it, why would it have been? They're like 20 years old, 21 years old. They don't know what the long term even is. Right? So like there had to have been the real the real problem was not the the kids who were struggling to organize, but the me and people like me and people older than me who had been on the left for a long time and abdicated the responsibility to be there and ready to lead in such moments. Yeah, I got to, I definitely was, I got to inherit the cynicism of the 90s, like the Naomi Klein, no logo kind of Mm. anti commodity mentality that so much of 90s, whether it was grunge or whether it was uh, just the punk that was still around. Mm -hmm. Uh, So a lot of that stuff was immediately clear to me when. NGOs or Democrats or whoever were trying to recuperate, you know, like Obama's second election sort of tactics, uh, mm-hmm. re- you know, short term reformism, not knowing how to build momentum over a longer period of time, things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't think that mentality is around anymore. And maybe it is, but. um. I don't notice it as much. I don't have kids or anything though either, so I'm not really tapped into a younger world. Yeah, I I am, you know, a generation older than you. You're uh, an older millennial, is that? Yeah, I'm 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 38. Yeah. So like I am 51. I'm a a, a middle range Gen Xer, I guess at this point. The older one of us are really old. But um and yeah, I have four kids age 17 to 25 and um i did i was aware through them of what was going on at least in one little you know scene um i you know what do you think key to or the or well we could ask tj clark but um or the the british the british situationists would would have made of um, I guess Guy Debord, let's stick with him. What would he have made of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn? Oh, I mean, he would I, He would reject them. I think mm-hmm. fairly, but that, that they wouldn't be a strange figure in France. I mean, they would be very moderate, socialist party, maybe, you know. <laughs> but Corbyn, I mean, the British that side then, and... In the UK, if you know, 
also you have to imagine that DeBoer is as old as he would have been would be now or or you know what I mean like you know, not like DeBoer then but uh well maybe I should just ask like what was do you know even know what TJ Clark's position was on Corbin no he's not actually he's not someone I came across a lot in what I was reading mm-hmm. so you know do you know um, who he is though you've heard of him no TJ Clark um was a member of the British SI uh and he i think he did some translations and um what i knew him for when i interviewed him he had written for the new left review back in 20 i think it was 2012 might have been a little earlier than that even um let me see when it, but it, he wrote a, an essay called uh, for a left with no future okay um and it was really arguing that we should accept the tragic component of life, not try to uh, aim at total transformation, but at continuity and um, that, that we should uh, be patient and accept that some things are not going to change. Um, I mean, and there's a lot more to it than that. And, and, and he refers to, I mean, it's very deeply literate and philosophically sophisticated essay. It's not just, I mean, my summary is a complete vulgarization, but nonetheless, it was arguing for a, a sense of the tragic on the left and a fear of uh, the urge to overturn society as it is now because he saw that as primarily coming from a fascist right, the new dawn in Greece. Oh um, yeah. You know? And so, um, so it, it, I, and I, I, I interviewed him right around the moment of Occupy Wall Street and, and Syriza. Mm-hmm. Emerging. And so like his essay seemed very much out of step with reality by the time it reached print. And it was like, we should be, you know, we should uh, accept what can't be changed, work for increment in an incremental way, um, uh, embrace the tragic. And then like, Oh, but look, there's Occupy Wall Street, which promises global and the Arab spring and, and um, Syriza. It's like, there's this moment of, supposed leftist triumph um, and a, a, a new possibility for a global transformation. Um, and I do recall in the interviewing him, it's like, yeah, that all looks good, but it's also so fragile and partial and yeah, and insufficient. Yeah, it is. I don't, I mean, back to Bernie Sanders though. I don't, you know, um, it was a good run, I guess, but ultimately I think the lesson is that you he was able to organize that much funding uh, from the working class uh, on such a large scale. It demonstrates that that can be done if you could get the working class behind something. I don't think politics is the right place to put that kind of funding. I think there's a lot of different, even if it went to unions, there's institutions that will last longer than a president. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm built, I'm putting my own critique in there instead of imagining what the board would say. But, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. When you, um, whenever you pick up a, a great figure that you admire and then try to make them into your ventriloquist dummy, you end up just, speaking whatever you think is true instead of <laughs> there yeah. become your 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 mouthpiece i mean i think he would see it as spectacular it, it was a spectacle mm-hmm. it was already recuperated when it started it mm-hmm. wasn't the real uh it wasn't a real break with the fundamental workings of capitalism it mm-hmm. it really reinforced uh, a lot of the different components of the system we have just, yeah. just by convincing such mass participation in the electoral system, which ultimately is going to keep this whole system together. 
Right. Um, I would say that uh, th- that I totally agree with you, but then the, the devil is in the details. It's like, what wouldn't be recuperated from the start? Um, what do we mean by recuperation? Do we need to start from a total break with capitalism, or can there be a way of organizing politically uh, that would allow the proletariat to break with capitalism um, by achieving power or, and and starting with end capitalism? Because we really we can't like I think for instance Occupy going back to the situation it's like Occupy wanted to prefigure the break, build mm-hmm. new communities first, and I think you have to like. Uh, get to the break th- by uh, uh, by using the capitalist forces that already exist to, I do, to get there. I think the mistake, though, is to use the political forces, or at least to rely on them. I, I'm not. I mean, like, well, you can't use the, dem- the bourgeois parties. You can't use the Democrats right. or the Republicans. But I think the hippies had something right until Charles Manson ruined it which was they were building communes and hmm. um what about jim were, jones didn't he help ruin it well, no the the whole <laughs> yeah exactly the mm-hmm. the figures that were cult leaders which comes out mm-hmm. of new age the new age mysticism that guy de board was so opposed to right, right? so mm-hmm. that was a toxic element that was in the 60s counterculture which uh became tragic all this all these gurus and cult figures that but the material conditions and the way that uh you know communes were able to be built to begin with that i think is a radical and worthwhile uh pursuit as long as they don't become isolated from the rest of the working class Mm -hmm. um I I am skeptical about communes, but maybe we should, you and I should do another set. We've got about 52 minutes in here. Yeah. Um, We should come back and do a whole episode on two subjects that I've always been wanting to tackle. Well, one more than the other, but they're kind of connected is um, I want to understand why cults and communes emerged after the new left. Like why were why did the cultists what was the cultist turn about what is the cult or com- communal project about and and why do, why did so many communes it's not just Jim Jones and Charles right. Martin, but why fun. did so many co- communes turn into cults and um, and you know what not only like what's wrong with communes but also like why why was that an attractive uh, solution in that moment. What what was what were people trying to overcome? So we should do that. Like, uh, uh, you know, I will try to do some research into that and think about it and suggest something to you. Maybe you can do the same for me, and we could talk again in a month or something like that. What do you say? Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah.